So that brings uh, a sort of power and deterministic uh, determinism to uh, the community and their monetary policy. All of a sudden, you know, without having to guess, how much your currency will be worth relative to, let's say, the re- the other currency, Intercoin. Right. Um, by just controlling either the numerator, which is what we are um, sort of, we have our stable coin solutions, which I'll talk about. And you can also implement any other, your own policy, right? You know, uh, manipulating the denominator. So say you want to, for example, uh, issue more local currency and airdrop it to people with yeah. a universal basic income, which Jason could talk about. Um, so you could do that. Um, you could you could continuously dilute your currency by one percent, let's say, a month, sure, one percent a year, and and th- that would be a way to solve hunger or food insecurity. Um, and then I could get into why uh, stable coins, uh, sort of, many many stable coin solutions are possible on top of this. But I do want to note about stable coins one thing: uh, no stable coin can be one hundred percent guaranteed. Um, because obviously, if you make a guarantee, like the Bank of England made a guarantee about a peg, and then George Soros and other currency speculators were taking advantage of that guarantee, essentially by cornering, uh, you know, forcing them to, to take losses all the time. So although, you know, you can't really have um, 100% stable coin unless you're backing it with 100% reserves. Right. Um, uh, I'm just going to say that by capping the upside you can, however, take money off the table, right, and and uh, and cap the upside. When Intercoin goes up and the community is pegged to it, well, then community currency will go up. But that would attract speculators, right? If you right. want to keep speculators out, you want to have utility, true utility tokens. Why would you want to have that? Well, maybe because you don't want to be governed by security, to- security token laws. You know, right? Yeah, that was I was going to get to that too. So yeah. I get it. So basically, I get it for the most part. So basically this model is to protect, correct me if I'm wrong, um, to absolve any potential legal risks with uh, SEC or, or securities laws. Is that correct for these ICOs if they were to launch on, on um, Intercoin's platform as opposed to going on their own and trying to build on top of Ethereum or some of these other smart contract platforms? Can you elaborate more on that or did I kind of hit it on the money? Yeah, you basically got it. I mean, it. I, look, I'm going to say sort of a larger picture is that, you know, the the interesting thing for for guys like us right building something that will change the world something improve the world which in my opinion you know the people who really change the world uh for the better are mostly not american presidents uh or anything <laughs> for sure <laughs> you know it, it, which is funny because they have all this power but really who changes the world is like guys like steve jobs you know everyone yeah. used an iphone uh the, the guys that invented you know the internet the guys that invented uh and ladies that invented, you know, um, the web, uh, email. So everyone's using these things for their own purposes and that's what improves the world. Right. Yep. So sort of the idea was like, Hey, you know, these open source projects, uh, projects like Wikipedia projects, like the web, you can view source anytime, right. You could do this. And so you could basically, um, any of these projects have sort of, been a net gain for humanity right yep and people were like well the problem was they're underfunded a lot of the time whereas uh sort of this uh, i would say collaborative model versus competitive model right in right. competition you fund you take all the risk you fund something big like a drug research right yeah a collaborative model you don't take that much risk you you just kind of don't have any patents or anything it's like Einstein building on top of Newton's right, laws. Sure. Newton building said, I stood on the shoulders of giants. So collaboration uh, needs to have maybe a payment system, nevertheless. Right. For people to sort of be paid out. And it's an interesting question. How much would they get paid? There's now Patreon. There's, you know, a brave uh, browser with the basic attention token. Yep. There's Netflix for, uh, you know. But the thing is, that these are all centralized a bit solutions. Right. As as, and um, so the promise was, what if instead of, let's say, let's go to my example of Cubix, Facebook, right? Facebook got a ton of VC money. They got all these users, but now guess what? They control all the 
interactions, right? They control all the data unencrypted. They store that data, like they can get to it. Right. So there's all this stuff that comes with that, right? And now we're talking on the level of like affecting a democratic election maybe, or yep. I don't know. I think honestly that it's not even, you know, the problem is what if everyone's data is leaked or hacked or whatever. So right. the idea was, hey, why don't we have a network that's owned by the participants, right? right. So the people kind of build it, like right here, they, the founders, they build it and then they get out. And then this yellow box goes away and you're back to just having this. Right. That was the promise of True utility. utility. Right. Exactly. That's collaboration. Instead, yeah. sort of with regulators, well, you know, they said they, they had a point. They said, listen, these consumers, among these consumers are tons of speculators, right? Right. And they're not buying Netflix token to, to watch movies. They're buying it to, uh, to essentially flip. speculate. Yeah. And I would argue that the non-scalability of Ethereum is to blame for that a lot of the time also. Right. It's a big part of that. Because if you can't really spend and make a hundred transactions, right? This is what, uh, you know, you will need a scalable platform. That's like the first thing I say is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have that, then you're essentially relegated to speculating. Right. Have any Ethereum tokens sort of graduated by now to being None. used for payment? None. As far as I can see, yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard of any like crypto kitties. Like they almost crashed the network. Yeah, no one's using this stuff right now, from what I right. see. Yeah. So that my point is, it can't be used for that. So what is it going to be used for? It's going to be used for speculation. Right. And it's going to essentially give utility tokens a bad name, which is what yeah. happened. Yeah. So we're trying to both solve the scalability problem, allowing payments to work, but also um, take a look at what the alternative is. The alternative is security tokens, right? Right. And security tokens is what we'd had to go through because, you know, by technically, by the how we test, um, a lot of these things could potentially bring a profit. Right. Right. But what if you were able to take all that profit off the table and guarantee there's no upside, right, um, to, let's say, a utility token? And we can get into why people would pre-buy a token in that case, right? Yeah. But they would certainly not buy it expecting the token to go up in price. They right. would buy it to actually use it, right. right? Right. So one of the things Intercoin, the goals of Intercoin is to bring back the market for utility tokens and for the regulators to actually be happy about it and be like, yeah, these are actually useful you know, things that are used. So essentially that's why I say it's like Ethereum 2.0 because it's gonna be something that's actually used for payment and for, um, you know, as opposed to speculation, it's going to be actually used in the real world, hopefully, with a bunch of pay buttons. Got it. So that's what Intercoin is doing. Interesting. How does the, um, can you go and elaborate a little bit more on the universal basic inf income um, feature to Intercoin? So let me ask you this. So let's just say a year or two down the line or even a couple of months down the line, Intercoin's launched. We can go buy the coin on, on exchanges or through Cubix. Um, well, how does this work? Do I like stake the coins in a wallet, kind of similar to proof of stake in a sense, and I just receive a dividend? Like how does this UBI or basic universal income uh, uh, feature work with Intercoin? Jason, you want to take that one? Well, Jason, we need you to unmute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. We can All right. Go. So, um, yeah. So universal basic income, each community, um, can uh, govern their own basic income. I call it community-based income, so I like to call it a CBI. Okay. Uh, but I don't want to reinvent uh, universal basic income. Just each community on their own can decide how much basic income to give out. And with all this um, data they can get from their own blockchain or for their own non-blockchain DLT, mm -hmm. um, they can get from their local fintech uh, how much is needed or, or the, the data in real time of what's being affected in the community and they could let the, gov the, the community have their own governance to choose. Should go up 1%, down 1% base income. So it'll be up to each community to adopt base, base income if they like okay. and, um, and govern their own base income. And that, that income comes from where? From the reserves or how does this? 
That's that, what I'm trying to wrap my mind around. How does that work exactly? Yeah. It's got to come from somewhere. So, so that that can come from uh, many different sources. Um, they can. Another thing is uh, I've been talking to Greg about is you know communities can uh, tokenize different assets that community, community owns because I've had people ask. Got well, it. why would a community want to put all their assets into Intercoin and then issue their own local currency? They don't have right. to put all their assets, but they back their own local currency, how much they want their currency to be worth or how much liquidity they want to have for it. And then other assets they can tokenize. And the, all it. these different assets can back the community, which would give out the base income. So it can be from top down or bottom up um, how the base income is given out. So essentially, the, uh, you can think of the basic income as, like I said over here, your community is sort of backed by Intercoin, right? What you could do is you could inflate the, low, uh, the denominator, the amount of uh, money mm -hmm. that uh, you issue, and you give it to everybody. And again, this is sound money in the sense that when you're coming in, you know the deal. You know exactly what the rules of the community are. And you choose whether to enter the community or not. Um, if, for example, I go into a city, Toronto dollars, they had this, for example. Okay. Uh, that particular uh, project eventually fizzled out. But um, again, this was with paper money a lot right. of the time. Is, uh, and, and Berkshires have it now, which is that you essentially get 10% of your money was going to go to the homeless or you know, to social programs. Yeah. Um, as you buy into the Toronto economy and then you get out, they you know, either on the way in or on the way out, they will, uh, they will have a tariff or, you know, conversion rate. Sure. And so, you know, I speak to a lot of libertarians and I speak to a lot of people of different political leanings. And, you know, you want this to essentially appeal to, to as many people as uh, it can, because, right. you know, there's many ideas about what money is or should be, uh, what monetary policy should be, what right. taxation should do. Right. And when I talk to anarcho-capitalists, uh, often you know the harshest critics of taxation they look at this and they say yeah this is actually just like a voluntary tax yeah we could totally get behind this um and uh you know you had sort of the uh more practical minded like outcome-based libertarians like milton friedman which are yeah. called a consequentialist or the utilitarians uh, they say universal basic income would be better than a welfare um a check because yeah. you don't lose benefits when you get a job, right? Right. And, you, you know, people watching this, they probably, some of them heard a lot about universal basic income. They have this thing in Alaska where everybody gets a dividend from the oil uh, proceeds of the state. And they get about $2,000 a year only. But Alaska has the least inequality of all U.S. states. And I think that started when they started the program. So just that 2000 a year, sort of a floor for everybody yeah. allows people to say, okay, well, I can pay for my food or I can pay for this or that. Right. Um, I uh, suppose they have 0% of people living on $5 a day. I live here in San Francisco and Greg lives in New York and there's a few thousand people at least in both those cities that live on $5 a day. Yeah. And, uh, some attribute it to the uh, permanent fund, the oil permanent fund. Interesting. And that's the thing is like, you can do things like, hey, do you want to end food insecurity in your community? Right. Well, give everybody a cell phone, right? And, they'll, and, and then that, they'll get this money supply, that city money, like right there on their phone. Um, you can't do anything like that um, right now. Right. Uh, well, maybe, I, I guess you can do that. I guess you can give people like snap cards, you know, these things where they use sure. them. But the idea is programmable money allows so much more than just, you know, loading up a card or something like that. Um, these are all kind of possible applications of what we call community uh, fintech applications, which are different than dApps. Right. Um, they're more robust in that they are designed to, to run within a community, right? Within sure. a community currency. Um, and again, each community is in charge of its own currency, its own policies. So they don't have to necessarily affect the rest of the network. And that's right. the other thing is the network is secure. These are, you know, experiments, just like they say states are laboratories of democracy, right? These are laboratories of financial technology and innovation and local level. So essentially UBI is either um, financed by existing circulating revenues and it looks exactly like a flat tax on everybody 
that essentially is used to pay for either public uh, works like yeah. parks or roads, but actually a UBI is not top down. It's not the elites deciding what to spend money on. It's right. the individuals, right? Deciding what to spend money on. And, you know, the other way it's funded is by donors to a community. Like let's say Haiti, I want to airdrop a bunch of money to Haiti right now. Use it right now. People can use it right now on the ground uh, as opposed to waiting for FEMA or IMF or someone to come in and, and top down sort of try to build stuff for them. Right. Somebody has to fix their chimney. Somebody has to uh, restore electricity. Right. Somebody has to get their kids to the hospital. These are very different things. It's not necessarily needs to be one size fits all solutions to that. And of course, besides donation, there's also tourism. Uh, there's also people visiting, going to Berkshires, right? Getting those Berkshires, right? And getting those Bristol pounds and spending them in the city. And what happens there is that the merchants are okay with losing two or three percent on transactions. They're okay with those kinds of things because that's what Visa does. Right. That's what PayPal does. Right. 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 And so, yeah, basically, it's um, that money could be used in a voluntary way to to help the community. So that's the UBI. Interesting. Aspect. Basically, you're building a lot, a, a lot of these communities could use having uh, this local fintech built for them and to be interconnected with other communities. So that's a big problem right now of different local um, currencies. That right. They don't have liquidity and interaction with other communities' local currencies. So Intercoin could be the bridge between these communities. So, like Calgary now announced they're going to have their own local currency. There's uh -huh. another uh, city that. Greg and I need to go contact. Um, there's been several cities uh, that we've contacted about Intercoin. Yeah. And we'd like to see um, uh, integration between these local currencies. Interesting. So essentially, this is you guys are building a truly democratic uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain ecosystem for communities to just basically connect with each other through this blockchain. And, and um, yeah, man, a pretty interesting project. Very, uh, very cool. Where are you guys right now in your roadmap? Do you guys have a Do you guys have the coin ready to go? Like, what What's um? Can you give us an update on your roadmap right now? Absolutely. Uh, basically, we spent the better part of uh, this year, um, you know, finalizing the architecture for all this, talking to other projects, sure. figuring out, you know, who our advisors are. Some of them are, by the way, uh, you know, uh, for example, Warren Mosler, who. Uh, you know, has advised even countries uh, sometimes if you read his book, sure. um, basically on how to issue their own currency. Okay. And, you know, we're trying to do this on the city level. So we have people, um, uh, Ryan Fuger early on advised, uh, advised us basically uh, on sort of this thing. Again, this is the guy that started the original Ripple before right. they were brought out. Yep. Um, and okay. then, uh, yeah, so basically, and then this guy invented uh, Kademlia. So we spent the better part of last year figuring out exactly what we're going to do and, and starting uh, to build the payment network on top of the social network. Where we're at is we have spent already around $700,000 on um, uh, building the Cubix platform for social networks. We already have 6 million users around the world. Right. We already have 53,000 uh, communities uh, as of now, um, using sort of community leaders, I should say, sure. using our apps. So these are people that have not such huge communities, not like a city or a university, yeah. but they, you know, they might be a soccer coach. They might have 50 people. They might be a, uh, a church pastor with yeah. like 500 people, parishioners. Uh, they might, uh, be a police captain, right? So yeah. we have already 53,000 um, community leaders. So the first thing that we would do is iterate with those people. Right. Uh, meaning we'd roll out, you know, to a hundred people, community leaders, see how well we can go, get through onboarding everyone, um, introducing, you know, that currency and making sure that it's secure. Once that works, we roll it out to everybody where we are now while we're doing that is we're pre-selling the tokens, right? Got it. And those tokens, I should mention, are securities in the view of, I think, some regulators. Um, so we're taking the position that, well, if they are going to be considered securities, 
we have a private placement memorandum right here on the site and disclaimers Correct. and essentially saying, please go read the PPM, which, you know, you should go read. Um, if you're an accredited sure. investor, um, you should go read it. And basically the, um, you know, we have, uh, anybody around the world can go buy intercoin if, if, um, you know, it's legal, uh, according to securities laws. Got and, it. So uh, you guys are not, a, you guys are not a security token just to clarify, or are you? We are in some sense a security token. This is what's weird is that there's this only a dichotomy, right? Between security token and utility token. Sure. Yeah. And people say rightfully so that the utility token is dead. I'd say mostly killed by the regulators. Right. right. Um, and also by the fact that Ethereum doesn't scale. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're trying to change that. We're trying to build, bring, if you, if you want, like if you're watching this, you want to, go back to investing in utility tokens and like building out these actually useful networks, then Intercoin is a vehicle to make that happen, hopefully. But what we're doing is we're selling a security. Um, again, I don't know if we personally think it is a security. I think it's very useful. Once it's launched, I don't think it will be considered a security even by US regulators. But again, I can't guess what they're going to say. Okay, so, so, gotcha. so basically you're not registered with the... Um with the SEC as of right now as a security token? Just well, no one, no one has registered any token as far as I know, right, Jason, with, with the SEC. It's all exemptions from registration. Uh, sorry, exemption. We, we've uh, filed exemptions, which got is a uh, form of registration. Got it, got that's it. We're not fully registered um, a public offering. That's an S1 would be. Nobody has done that. Got it, got it. Okay, gotcha. And, uh, we met with the regulators. We shouldn't say the name of who we met but we met with regulators at the SEC headquarters on February 27th this year. And at that time, they gave us a whole different view that they said, Ethereum, Bitcoin, they're all securities. Yeah. Um, yeah. They came out later. Well, they didn't say they're all securities. They say they may be securities at that time. Yeah, they said, yeah, they said maybe securities. Um, and then a couple months later, they said Ethereum's not a security. Um, right. So I think that gives a lot of hope in the space that uh, many projects that are open source and de truly decentralized Unlike Ethereum, I have a lot of thoughts that it's not uh, decentralized as they make it out. Sure. Make. It's one monolithic um, blockchain. that well, They've, roll, they've rolled them. back transactions before, from what I understand. That too. With the whole DAO situation. So. And that's yeah. something we wouldn't be able to do with any community. They have control of their own community currency. Got so it. We well, yeah, as far as I know, I just want to say this, is that it's... Uh, it's an interesting uh, world because our, our current financial system is seller beware. It's not buyer beware. Right. There's yeah. chargebacks, right? Yeah. And buyers yeah. feel very secure, uh, you know, buying stuff and maybe they can get it returned. Right. With the crypto ecosystem, you may have that with escrow, you know, multi-sig and stuff like that. But for the most part, you have non-reversible transactions at the base layer, right? Right. If I send you the money, the only way you're going to send me the goods is if you know that money is irreversibly in your account. So right. there's that fundamental sort of impotence mismatch, you know, getting money into the system, which, I, by the way, I would argue a lot of the reason that um, the crypto market caps also grew is because as much, you know, you had to get the money into the system, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's not always easy to just get it out right right, right. away. It's clunky. People don't want to just give you that money back. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Get it. Uh, and multiply that across, you know, the whole world but, sure. for a few years. But uh, no, but there's really legitimate, I think, um, there's legitimate value to Bitcoin, legitimate value to, to Ethereum. I just feel that newer technologies, you know, it's like the cassette player versus like, the iPod, right? There's sure, legitimate yeah. value to playing music. Right. Repeatedly, right? Obviously. Yeah. But Steve Jobs saw everyone's using their Walkman. And he's like, I can do better than, than this, right? Yeah. And sort of, and that opened a whole new world. Now we're all using iPhones. So, but right. to, get, to get back to like, what is uh, to the brass tax? What are we doing? Where are we at? We're, se we're pre-selling these tokens. Got it. There is definitely um, a possibility of making uh, profits. Okay, on this. Sure. Uh, similarly to how if you bought Bitcoin initially at like two cents, right? Yeah. You had a good chance. So we're currently selling this at seven cents. 
Um, and you definitely couldn't say that if you're a Tilly token. So what Greg just said right there is definitely makes us a security by making that statement. Well, that's what I mean. It's, it would seem to be, in my opinion, there's a possibility of making money, right? Yeah. Um, if there was no possibility, like with these uh, pegged currencies, it would be a utility, in my opinion, and opinion of many lawyers. Uh, but what we're selling is something that can make you money. It also might not, right, if we fail. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. And that's why you've got to read all these disclosures. Absolutely. But the point is that people pre-buy this, and then we are issuing an intermediate token next to go on exchanges in 2019. So what that means, okay, is that people who buy the Intercoin uh, intermediate token yeah. will be able to trade it before the network is launched, the actual Intercoin network is launched, which is what every Ethereum token is doing now. You know, right. So we're actually issuing this probably on Ethereum, it looks like, uh, you know, with Securitize um, or Quark Connects or one of the companies that uh, specializes in this. And then gotcha. there are now these uh, ATSs that are coming out like Open Finance, T0, that are listing security tokens. So when people ask, are you a security token? We say, yes, we're a security token, which we are um, a security. And right. we're a token. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the same time, we're also thinking about tokenizing our cash flows and giving them to people who have this intermediate intercoin uh, token. Cash flows like the validators that I spoke about sure. taking a percent of the transaction. So, you know, you might get a cash flow as well. It's kind of nice, um, yeah. but you're helping to fund an ecosystem that will bring utility tokens that actually work uh, right. to, to right. the world. And I like to see us become a security coin and then not a security coin at all and be utility tokens. So, we're a security token if we're going to have an intermediate token on Ethereum. And the people don't realize the difference between a token and, um, and a coin is a token would run like on Ethereum. A coin, you have your own base layer protocol. So we're building our own non-blockchain distributed ledger technology, of, um, our own that we'll have everybody else build on top of. Got it. Okay. So the, the, the network is not live yet, the main net. Um, or the protocol that is, but that's going live sometime in 2019. Which quarter exactly should we expect to see uh, Intercoin out on the market in terms of being able to actually use the actual coin? So for all that information, first of all, you could go to the white paper. Okay. You could look at the roadmap. There's tons of information in the white paper on sort of anything that you might want to know. Let's say the roadmap. Uh, as you go to the roadmap, you see, you know, we want to have our sort of token issuance by this time. Got we want it. to get on exchanges by this time, hopefully. Again, all these are subject to sure. the vagaries of life, right? Yeah. Um, and then you've got um, the private alpha, which is essentially us testing with community leaders we have now. Um, hopefully that works. You get the public beta, which you actually start to work with cities, okay? Okay. Uh, and community pilot projects. I mean, cities have actually allocated tens of millions of dollars just for UBI, okay? Just for UBI. So we're talking about cities like Berkeley, uh, not Berkeley, uh, Stockton, California. Michael oh, they Tuff, made it. <laughs> yeah. They're like the now first even Chicago. Went. What's that, Jason? They uh, allocated $40 million for Stockton, California. That's just Stockton, California. I mean, there's about 30 cities, 36 cities. So we know a guy uh, who's running for president in 2020, or at least, you know, he has a campaign to do it. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Yang. And Jason, can you briefly just yeah, mention? Officially announced. Yeah, Andrew Yang announced on CNN, MSNBC, and CNBC. Yeah. And uh, he's running on universal basic income. I know him. Um, I know about, I, mean, I don't know him personally, but I, I've seen, um, I've seen an advertisement or something along the lines of him. So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go for it. So, yeah. We, we talked to him from time to time. Um, he, his uh, campaign said that they make introductions to us to different cities. Got it. And, um, yeah, we're working with anything he needs from us. We like to help him with because we, we're like in the same, you know, we have the same beliefs. Got it. Got it. So like, what for about? example, here, um, Andrew Yang, this is the guy. And uh, the thing is with, um, he knows the mayors of many cities, a growing number of cities that want to do UBI, right? Right. 
So think about it. We've you got have a pilot program or, or want to have program. Exactly. So what happens is you've got here um, a UBI that you might want to do. And of course, if it's backed by Intercoin, then these cities would buy a certain amount of Intercoin, maybe tens of millions of dollars each. Sure. Right? So that's what you get as an investor, like an in Intercoin, one of the things that uh, who's going to ultimately buy this other than other investors, right? Because if there's no use for it, then it's just people, you know, selling it to the bigger fool in the end, right? right. It's not what this is about. This is about actual use cases within yeah. cities, within communities. So we're doing these community pilot projects. Uh,